Hey guys, it's Emily from Smart Edition Academy. Thank you for joining us for our TEAS science review on the endoprint system. Now, before we get started, I do want to preface by saying there are three things that I want you to pay attention to in the links in the description below. The first is going to be our free diagnostic TEAS practice exam. This is a great practice exam to use if you are just getting started with studying for the TEAS or if you've been studying for a while and you just want to evaluate your strengths and your weaknesses. The next thing that you're going to see in the description below is a link to join our free TEAS study group. This is a great Facebook group. Everyone is welcome to join if you are studying for the TEAS. We have so many subject matter experts, a lot of students just like yourself studying for the TEAS, daily practice questions, helpful videos every day. It's a really great place to check out and always kind of be studying on the go for the TEAS. And lastly, as you can see here, we've got our ATI T6 online course. Now our founder, John of Smart Edition Academy is actually married to a nurse and that's how they came up with Smart Edition Academy. John's wife, Melissa, was actually studying for her nursing entrance exams and she was so frustrated that she was having to piece together a little bit of here, a little bit from over here, a little bit from Pinterest and this cheat sheet and is this book good or am I reading too much? And so they had to, they said to themselves, there has to be a better way. So Everything that you see in our ATI T6 course, including uh, over 100 videos, over 400 flashcards, 26 lessons, 54 topics, eight full ATI T practice tests with over 1,500 realistic T questions. This is everything that you need to know. We also have a mobile app, and we also have really in-depth video explanations and answer explanations for each of our practice test questions. So this is totally worth it. This is everything that you will need for the TEAS and we've also got a money back guarantee. So there's really no losing here. So the video that you're about to see comes straight from lesson eight, topic two out of our science A and P section. This is all about the endocrine system. We're gonna go over the functions of the endocrine system, the chemical signals, the receptors, the hormones, the regulations of secretion, the glands, and also the effects of aging. All of these will absolutely 100% appear on the tea. So get your notebooks ready. And without further ado, enjoy the lesson, guys. The endocrine system has many functions, as you can see here. But there's something that all of these functions have in common, maintaining homeostasis. But that might seem a little obvious, because isn't that the purpose of every body system? In fact, the endocrine system maintains homeostasis by working closely with the nervous system, which you can recall to regulate functions involved with chemical and hormonal balance. You can also recall that the nervous system coordinates movement through neurons with electrical impulses and chemical messages in the matter of our brain and spinal cord. But there are more functions that require a similar messaging system in the body to regulate activity. It's not necessarily done through neurons, but it still requires a message of some sorts and a receiver or receptor of that message. The message is delivered as a chemical signal, but more specifically known as ligands, the molecules which are released to travel from one location within the body delivered as a message elsewhere in the body. But these signals can be broken down into different categories, intracellular versus intercellular. Based on the naming system, you can imagine that intracellular chemical signals are the ones that travel within the same cell. So ligands can get released somewhere from one organelle, say the endoplasmic reticulum, and bind to the receptors of another organelle, such as the mitochondria, but in the same cell. In contrast, intercellular messages are messages that get carried outside of one cell onto another cell. It can get a little more complex than that, which is why intercellular messages can further be divided into different categories. These categories help classify the signals based on tissues they are secreted from and further regulate. For example, we have this category of neuromodulators and neurotransmitters, where the chemical signals are secreted by nerve cells and specifically aid in the nervous system, and the message is passed along through the neurons. This is drastically different from pheromones, which actually gets secreted out into the environment, a very broad and general scope in contrast to the tight and close network of neurons. These are different from the autocrine and paracrine categories. Autocrine chemical signals are ligands that affect the cell type from which they are secreted, hence auto. 
paracrine chemical signals differ in that the signals secreted will affect other cell types. Don't let this confuse you with the concept of intercellular messages because this whole category is defined as the chemical message that gets carried outside of one cell onto another cell. In the case of paracrine signals, that message influences how another cell type responds. If you look in our example here, we have the pancreas, which is responsible for secreting both somatostatin and insulin. But the secretion of somatostatin inhibits the release of insulin, so one cell type affecting another and happening within the same organ. Looking beyond, it's important to note that the chemical signals are received by receptor molecules to produce a response. These can otherwise be considered proteins or glycoproteins. The way that these receptors work is through specificity, very much how puzzle pieces match together. So do ligands and their receptor molecules. You can notice in this diagram how the ligand will match up to the receptor protein. But beyond just the pieces matching, receptors allow for not only the shape, but the chemistry of the ligands to match in order to pass on the messages to the intended cells and influence the proper tissues. Referring back to our breakdown of chemical signals, the intercellular chemical signals have two major types of receptors, intracellular and membrane bound. Now don't let this confuse you with chemical classes of intracellular and intercellular. Just to repeat, Chemical signaling classes identify if the signal is transmitted and received within the same cell, intracellular or of a different cell, intercellular. The intracellular receptor just defines that the receptors are located inside the cell, within the cytoplasm or nucleus, rather than on the surface like with membrane-bound receptors. In that case, the receptors extend across the membrane where the receptor site is on the outer surface of the membrane. These specific membrane receptors can fall into three different categories, G-protein coupled, ion channel, and enzyme-linked receptors. The naming is a result of the mechanism by which the signal is processed. So there is an intercellular chemical signal, a ligand released from one cell going to the receptor of another cell. This message is going to be processed via the membrane of the cell receiving the message. That membrane-bound receptor will process it based on the message being sent. Enzyme-linked receptors will read or interpret the chemical signaling that influences enzyme production or inhibition. Ion channels will receive by ions, which affect the permeability of cells, and thus the ions available within the cell and overall body. G-protein coupled receptors will process hormones. Now hormones signal all over the body since they are produced in a minute amount and then travel via the blood. As you can see with our diagram, like in the instance of a G-protein coupled receptors, these very specific receptors are located on target cells. In other words, when a hormone is secreted, specific tissues or target tissues have the target cells with the receptors for that specific hormone to be read as a chemical message and produce a response for those specific tissues. Therefore, a hormone cannot influence a tissue or even a cell for a response if they don't have any of those specific hormone receptors to register the message. With the hormones, their secretion is controlled by a negative feedback mechanism. In other words, with hormones, maintaining homeostasis requires a specific range of values. So when the body recognizes that hormone is circulating the body at a manageable quantity, the body will trigger secretion reduction and vice versa. That secretion of hormones is managed by other hormones, the chemical levels of blood and the nervous system. As people age, hormone secretion can change over time. 
That doesn't mean the general flux of secretion and inhibition of hormones, which is considered normal homeostasis. Looking at this chart, we can identify those specific hormones that have a tendency to change as we age. When you think about it, it makes sense. For example, free-floating estrogen or testosterone decreases as a person ages, which accounts for bodily changes that women get as they age to a point where their body can no longer carry children, otherwise hitting a phase of menopause. Or in the case of men, free-floating testosterone, which affects metabolism, muscle mass, and strength, and overall physical drive. For more information regarding these common hormones, these charts within the Smart Edition text reveal target tissues and responses. So when we see here that as growth hormone increases protein synthesis, it affects most tissues. We recognize the natural decrease in growth hormone secretion as a person ages would affect our muscles, physical strength, and ability. An overall association that the older we become, especially as elders, we become more fragile.